want to share with you, uh, and I think most of the officers here and, and all of the ones here on the panel say will give their own view in terms of the benefits of the cameras, uh, that we will be wearing. All of you know that at least it's from my perspective, and I think me, others here will, will also do likewise with their perspective. But I can say this, that I believe it's going to short circuit a number of the uh, complaints that we receive uh, there at the Sheriff's Office. I think it's going to be a great tool, but I think we should be, uh, as always, on the cutting edge of technology. I think the public need to know that every encounter that we encounter on the streets, that every citizen is not a bad citizen, they need to know that every officer that is uh, present themselves, that all officers are not bad. Uh, it also will assist, and I'm sure with the number of complaints that we will get, uh, clearly on officers, because uh, it's going to keep the officers on their toes at all times. And when there is a dispute, one thing about it, if this camera captured the event, then possibly uh, give you a positive direction in handling this dispute. Again, this morning, I want to thank you for coming out. I am Laura Tate, the project manager for the um, Body Worn Camera. When you see that BWC, Body Worn Cameras. So um, as a project manager, we've had to do a whole lot as a team. Um, it is how you get money from the federal government. They tell you what to do, when to do it, how long to do it. So as a team, we've been working all year very diligently. Um, we've had to do policy. Uh, we've been meeting every month, sometimes twice a month. And it's just been a wonderful thing. We have all types of experiences. That makes a difference. I know one thing, you know another. So with all of us coming together, we've made a big difference. So what I would like to do, as I call your name, I would like you to stand up. Uh, Sheriff Lisa Brown, we all know. Chief Jerry Carter, Brandon Eskew, our IT, IT director, Ms. Brandon Birch, she's our brand administrator, Captain Keith Crum, Captain Marty Roberts, Captain Sammy Banks. First Lieutenant Smith, <laughs> Ms. Tom Porter, <laughs> uh, Dr. Darren Wright, <laughs> Ms. Haley Giles, <laughs> Mr. Joey Sanders, <laughs> Ms. Kathy Heron, <laughs> Ms. Katie Ryder. Lieutenant Paul Gunter, <laughs> Melanie Bell, Ms. Melanie Bell, Melanie Corbin, Sergeant Mike Cunningham. In 2015, the Newton County Sheriff's Office was awarded a grant for the body worn cameras. And from the very beginning, we recognized that this would be a tedious yet necessary and beneficial process for the community as a whole. The Sheriff's Office, the District Attorney's Office, Public Defender's Office, Juvenile Court, religious organizations, um, as well as advocacy groups, we came together to form a stakeholders team. Each of the parties worked in conjunction to assure all things related to body worn cameras was in place before we put the first camera on the streets. Each one of us have vested interest in the body worn camera program. And though we understand that the body worn cameras will impact us all, we do recognize that this impact will be from different perspectives. So each speaker this morning will discuss the benefits of the body worn camera from their agency's associated aspect. I'm very proud to be a part of this community, been a part of this community all my life. And uh, I think we have good officers, we have good leadership, we have good citizens. We just all get in some trouble every now and then and need some help. And uh, it's, it's kind of, um, it's, it's just great to be a part of a community that is, 
is looking forward and trying to head off any issues. And technology seems to be taking us this way. I think technology can be a curse and a blessing, uh, but because it is available, it seems like that we, we need to be taking these steps. I'm just glad that our leadership has um, found a way to kind of make us in the forefront in, in this state and in this area at, at doing this. So uh, thank, thank all you guys for your work. And there's been a lot of discussion uh, to try to make sure that we're fully vetting all of the potential issues. We won't see them all, but uh, I have a total assurance that our, our sheriff and uh, his deputies and his leaders uh, will make every effort to make sure this program is implemented with as much ease and uh, grace as possible. As a part of the district attorney's office, we are very excited about the prospect of body-worn cameras and what that will mean for uh, increasing transparency in all of the cases that we deal with, as well as assisting us in hopefully limiting some of the um, hearings that we have to have in court, because a lot of the hearings that we have have to do with um, Fourth Amendment issues, was consent given, um, was someone read the Miranda warnings, and the fact is now that you know, we're going to have that on video, and I've talked to many of the defense attorneys that we see on a regular basis, and even they have talked about how, you know, that will really reduce the motions they have to file, because they'll be able to say to a client, here you are on video, here you are consenting to the search, here you are being read your Miranda warnings, and it's going to clarify a lot of the issues that we see in the courtroom. We're also very excited about the transparency it's going to bring to our prosecutions, um, and as well as our when we review officer-involved shootings. Um, when those do occur in the community, it is the responsibility of the district attorney, the district attorney, excuse me, to review those after the Georgia Bureau of Investigation has concluded their investigation. Um, and it's going to be incredibly helpful to have these body-worn cameras to know exactly what happened from um, the police officer's perspective. We're going to be able to see exactly what they saw in the moment where they had to make the decision to draw their weapon and fire. Um, so I think it's really going to help with transparency and really help deal with any issues. Thankfully, we haven't had a lot of these issues here in Newton County yet, but we've seen what's been going on across the country. And I'm excited about the idea of using this technology early on to go ahead and get out in front of these issues and to address them head on from the very beginning. So I really think we're going to see some decreased litigation over certain issues in criminal cases, um, speeding up the process. Uh, we're very excited, too, that we're we checked out a lot of different organizations. I know that um, Deputy Sailors and that Brandon Eskew spent a lot of time trying out a lot of different equipment, and they have found a program that's going to be helpful for them um, technologically, but it's also going to work great um, for the DA's office and for us to share with defense attorneys through the discovery process. Um, so I think we picked the best possible group to go with as far as our technology, and we're just very excited about what this is going to mean for us from the prosecutor's perspective. Hi, thank you for being here. My name is Kathy Heron, and I um, want to first take an opportunity to thank um, Sheriff Brown and Chief Carter for your leadership and the rest of the stakeholder team, but specifically the people from the Newton County Sheriff's Department who are on this committee with us because I have been most impressed by the level of professionalism, preparedness, and their willingness to listen to all of the advocacy groups that were represented as stakeholders and to uh, listen to our suggestions and to make some changes to some of the wording and some of the language that was being used in their policies. So thank you very much for that opportunity to participate. Um, you know, I provide a unique perspective because not only am I a retired employee for the Department of Family and Children's <coughs> Services or the Division of Family and Children's Services, having worked 12 years as a Child Protective Services investigator here in Newton County, I also have the privilege of being a member of this community and having raised children here. So I kind of represent two factions. One would be John Q. Public, um, because I'm a citizen of this community and I want to live in, uh, and raise other generations of children who are in caring, loving families and communities. Um, along with my professional career, which I was not the only social worker on the team, and so I was glad to make friends with Dr. Wright down at the other end. Um, because we have some things in common that um, around representing and making sure that all groups of people are represented and their needs and their issues are represented. Uh, this is technology, and it's only technology, but it's a tool, and it's a tool that is not just to protect or to preserve what occurred at that particular point in time when the officer engaged with a member of our community but also gives us an opportunity to try to understand what occurred. And as my particular uh, former professional career 
And as a citizen, I really went into the uh, participating in the stakeholder process as though this was really a customer service response. What is it that we're going to be able to see as a use of this technology that is going to affirm and or give us some ideas about what customer service looks like in our community? And I am um, happy to endorse and to speak um, today to you as other concerned citizens as to the vetting process that was used, why one particular piece of technology was selected over another, um, and really deferring back to the, the men and women who are going to be wearing the actual equipment and all of the policies, and there are massive amounts of policies and procedures that go in behind the use of this technology, but to give you some assurances as a citizen that I am very, very impressed with the level of detail and the level of commitment that the Sheriff's Department and its employees are making towards um, making sure that our community is safe and protected. I'm the Body Warrant Coordinator, also work in the IT department. Um, a couple months ago, or I'm sorry, about five or six months ago, I was brought in to help uh, decide on what type of camera we're going to wear. Um, on the end, on the other side of Deputy Gilbert is Josh Sudvik, he is our TASE representative. Um, we've spent numerous hours of talking to him and working out details and stuff. Um, we've decided to go with the Taser Body Worn Camera, which is the POV, which is the Flex Camera, which the Patrol Division, um, and our Special Investigation Unit, our Crime Suppression Unit, and our Warrants Division all will be wearing the point of view. Um, our transport officers, our SROs, and our Special Response Teams, and CID will be wearing the Body Worn Camera. Um, we've tried out numerous cameras, and the ones that gave us the best for what our department needs and to handle the situation, Taser offers us. We have, a, with their programs come a evidence.com, which is where we'll be able to secure our videos through. It's going to be a cloud-based storage. Um, they will handle the storage of the cameras. Once we download a video, the deputy will go in and put in the case number of what they just handled and then what type of call it was. Um, once that is done, instead of the investigator having to hunt for the video from the deputy or have to burn to save money, um, the deputy, can, the investigator can go into evidence.com and type in their password and be able to pull up that case and that video. So that way they have it right there and then so they can go ahead and start the process to help solve the cases a lot faster. Um, the DA's office will also have access to evidence.com so they'll be able to once again go in, put in the case and we'll be able to get the videos faster so that way they can begin their prosecution process. Um, by going with Taylor, also led into us uh, going with their in-car cameras, which should be implemented sometime next year, which also will help um, with evidence.com because it will upload both videos together. So when we put in the case numbers, it automatically joins them together. So that way they're not having to hunt down two separate videos. Um, we do have a couple of the uh, cameras that Deputy Gilbert has worn, he will be speaking on the aspects of how to operate it and how to wear it. Good morning. My name is Patrick Gilbert from the Sheriff's Office. I'm working in our traffic division. Um, I have worked with several different vendors, as Deputy Sotis has, has told y'all, um, in the last six months or so. I have worn, I can't even give you how many different types of cameras. The cameras we went with are Taser, point of view and body worn cameras. That by far is the best camera for the needs of our agency and the needs of our county. The point of view, which is what most patrol officers will carry, is a very small camera, as you can see here. This is the actual camera itself. There's several different ways you can wear it. Uh, there's one mount here. There's a different mount that actually wears on your sunglasses. I'm more than happy to let y'all see as we're done with everything. But the biggest, the biggest feature of what I can tell you with the point of view camera that Taser provides is wherever you as the officer are looking, it will show what happens. Uh, a body-worn camera, which is this one here. Body-worn camera is actually worn on your body, your person itself. It, it, it will show what happens, but in my opinion, the point of view is the best part of the taser. Um, if you conduct a traffic stop, it shows exactly what the driver is doing. It can actually catch the violation prior to the traffic stop, such as they run a stop sign, they run a red light, stuff like that. The camera records 30 seconds prior to activation. The activation of the camera is very simple. You hit the button on the center, which is uh, about the size of a half dollar. It's, um, it beeps to let you know that it's activated. At that point, you're recording. When you get ready to deactivate the camera, you hold the same button down, and it will be 
again let you know the camera's off. The functions of the camera uh, are very simple. A two-year-old can take care of this camera and make it work. That's kind of good for us, too. Sometimes we have a lot going on, and it's a little easier just to go and hit a button and make the camera work. Some of the other cameras we've looked at in the past, you have two or three things that you have to do to make the camera actually come on. Um, I work serious injury and fatality crashes for the county. One thing that I can definitely tell you that I like with this camera, instead of just having still shots of the scene itself, now I have video footage of the entire scene that I walk through. As I paint the scene or do anything of that nature, once I can turn it over to the DA's office for prosecution, if, prosecution, if need be, at this point now they have the entire from beginning to end of actually what happened. Um, I'm, I'm looking very forward to having these cameras as soon as we can get them on the street. Hey, I'm Josh Sutback. I'm with uh, Taser, uh, who Newton County has uh, chosen to go with. And uh, I just want to say first and foremost that uh, the panel and Brandon and Joey and Patrick, everybody here, has, uh, they've done a great job putting me through the ringer. Um, they have been very specific about everything uh, for the county. I can say that they definitely have your best interest at heart. Um, they kept making me go back, change contract, change the quote. So I think we put together a great plan for the county. And just to give you guys a little bit of uh, the specs behind the body camera that they chose, the Axon Flex uh, is a point of view camera, as uh, Debbie was saying. Uh, it will get a 12 hour battery out of it. So essentially, it will last for the entire shift. It actually gets a little bit more than 12 hours. Um, we have what's called a true dock and walk system. The whole purpose behind that is to alleviate any thought process behind any of the officers at the end of their shift. They take the battery and the camera. They dock it and they walk away. There's nothing else they have to do. These cameras are designed to essentially show what the officer's perspective is. What that means is that it's designed to mimic the human eye. Um, we could have gone with 1080 and given the clearest picture out there. Taser is real big about showing the officer's perspective. And I want to be you know, very clear about that. Uh, if there's a video that is being shown in court, it would be great to show what a, a super awesome high-tech device can see, but we're trying to actually show what the officer sees day to day. Um, so the camera sees in about 480p. Uh, it has low light capability, which means it can see at night just like an officer can see. If they need a flashlight to see something, so does the camera. If the officer can hear it, the camera can hear it as well. If the officer cannot hear it, the camera can't hear it. So we have done a lot of research and development behind this, and we've been able to get a camera that is uh, as close to the human eye uh, as possible. And then also, once the cameras are docked, it automatically gets uploaded into evidence.com. That's where all of this footage is managed. Uh, there's gonna be an in-car that the uh, sheriff's office is looking at, uh, possibly even interview room. All of this is managed under one roof, and there will be a prosecutor's version uh, that the DA will have access to as well. Uh, so we're trying to tie in just one system for all digital evidence needs for the sheriff's <coughs> And uh, if you guys have any questions about anything at all with evidence.com, body cameras, uh, I'm going to be here for a little bit. Please feel free to ask me any questions. That you have. We're starting off with the point of view. This is a traffic stop that was conducted by Deputy Gilbert. Um, it's going to show about 30 seconds before the actual video can take place. Hello. Hey, I'm Deputy Gilbert, and you're the county sheriff's office. May I have a driver's license, please, sir? Thank you. The reason I stopped you is you didn't stop the stop sign all the way back there. Any reason for that? I didn't see it. You didn't see the stop sign? No, sir. 
Okay. Yeah. You're still living in a social circle? Yes, sir. All right, well, give me just one second. We'll be right back with you. Okay, right, sir? Thank you. Zero five three two two four five eight nine. Zero Right, and I went twenty feet. Uh, extension fourteen twenty two one four two two. Nine eight five radio. I got a BIM two eleven camper. Right, and I went twenty feet. B Bravo. 9122, 28 returns on 2006. Dodge Charger, black and color to John Davis out of Kevin Sinbad at the negative 27. Still Eddie Sailors. Post circle, class B, valid, turn on the name. Tibble. Tibble. All right, sir. Here's your driver's license back. All that is a written warning from the sheriff's office. There's no court date, no fine, does not go on your driving record. You just need to be a little bit more careful for me out here, okay? All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Drive safe. All right, thank you. If you're wearing the point of view, as you can tell in the video, it actually captures the violation. That's very helpful in court. It also, if I'm sitting there writing my citation, writing my warning, whichever it is, if you notice the camera would look down and look up, that's me writing my citation. If something happens, the subject comes out of the vehicle or anything like that, that's going to be captured on camera. Versus the body camera, which is worn roughly here on the center of your chest, if you notice what you would have seen would have been the steering wheel. At that point, what good is it really going to be for officer safety wise? Uh, that's one of, the, one of the biggest reasons that we went through. All right, the next video you're going to see is going to be. Uh, basically an investigative type of interview it's going to be it's uh using the body worn camera so that way you get the aspect of what, what where the body camera catches so basically if the deputy looks left or right you're not going to see what he's looking at it depends on the way he turns his body hi doing sir Cooper cunningham newton county sheriff's office your neighbor next door 55 got broken into did yes, you sir. see anything happen uh yeah it actually i did i saw a young kid probably you know teenager got teenagers all over this neighborhood okay uh, young kid about five foot eight, maybe 150 pounds. Okay. Come out of there maybe an hour ago. An hour ago? About an hour ago. Okay. Well, Come out of the back wearing? door. What was he wearing? He was wearing like a dark t shirt and uh, and jeans. Okay. Was he carrying anything in his hands? I didn't get a good look at him uh -huh. because he was running. Okay. And he ran in that direction over there. Have you ever seen him in a neighborhood before? No, but like I say, there's too many kids around here to keep up with sometimes. And there's there are trails that run between the houses back okay. there, too. Okay, okay. You, you normally see a lot of people in that trail or walking around in the woods or all anything the like time, that? All the time, all hours of the day and night. Okay. The good thing about that is if the, an investigator goes out and they're talking to a person to interview, we're also getting them on video now, not just a tape recorder. So if they try to say, you know, that's not me on the tape, well, the video record's going to show you. Um, another thing that if you notice, as he's standing there, you can't really see what the person is doing with his hands because they're down by his side. So, I mean, if he goes to reach for something, and if, if the deputy has to draw out with his weapon, um, it's going to be blocked because of the body cam. Um, so that's one reason why we like the POV for our patrol services. Um, investigations, it would be perfect for them because, like I said, it, uh, we have a lot of people that would like to take back their statements and stuff when they tell us. Um, and it's for when you're right there on camera talking, you can't say it's not you. From the NAACP's perspective, we see this as a step in the right direction. In 2014, the NAACP had issued a comprehensive report 
And the name of that report, I encourage everyone to look that up, is called Born Suspect, Stop and Frisk Abuses and the Continued Fight to End Racial Profiling in America. We see this as a step in a positive or, or right direction because it does address one of the recommendations in that report. Um, we do believe there are other systemic issues that need to be addressed, but we commend uh, the, uh, Newton County and the Sheriff's Department for taking these steps in the right direction. Transparency is important. Our community and our citizens need to feel safe. And I think one's perspective or perception of that reality is real. So the 21st century policing Police, policing requires a lot more understanding of human behavior. And uh, more and more we're dealing with a different generation as well, who perceive things differently in terms of how the police interact with them. And we think this is a step in the right direction. We're upgrading uh, our uh, uh, law enforcement personnel with tools that can, uh, that can help uh, in a soft way, uh, but in a very powerful way, help them do their jobs and help them do uh, their jobs even more effectively. And so I, um, I thank you all for rising up to the level where you're going to get these uh, body cameras that uh, record the interactions uh, between you and the public. Uh, it's very important, as you know, uh, the relationship between law enforcement and the public has been uh, tested, has been challenged uh, of late. And uh, that is something that we can go into the issues of why that is, and, uh, and I don't think there's much dispute about why it is. Uh, and that's not the real issue. The real issue is what can we do moving forward to uh, create better relations between the community and law enforcement and strengthen that relationship. And I think the body cameras uh, are uh, a step in that direction because they keep everybody honest. They keep both sides of the equation honest, if you will. Or at least provide for an independent way where the truth can, can be told and can be seen, actually. So, uh, yeah, once again, I want to uh, congratulate you. I want to congratulate uh, Sheriff Brown for running a very professional state-of-the-art department uh, that is leading the way uh, in our area. And I uh, look forward to working with you all to make sure that we uh, make our communities safer and make them more attractive for people to, to uh, live, work, and play. And we can have a vibrant community and all live together in peace and harmony. All right, so I just want to be clear, there are two types of cameras. And so the officers I have a lot of contact with, obviously, SRAs. So those are going to be the body ones. Right. Okay. And then um, I was not clear, but it sounded like, is this going to be the officer's equipment so they have the responsibility themselves of docking it every night, or is this checked in at shift change, or how is this going to work so it's ensured that it's, it's docked, it's downloaded, and it's recharged? Um. What's going to happen is at the end of each shift, they're going to come in and they're going to place it into the um, into the docking station, and it will upload. Um, if they're running over for the night, then they can bring it back in before shift and dock it again. Um, the good cable also Taser is supposed to be sending out firmware too that's going to allow wireless download. We have set up the sheriff's office already with Wi-Fi capability, so as soon as the sheriff's office as soon as you pull into the sheriff's office it starts to download automatically there's a wireless setup in front of the building to the uh, gas around our gas pump area and then also in our intake area so there's no place that that is not covered to where once they pull in and in each deputy will be issued one with their personal camera will be assigned to them will have their information and our policy actually dictates how you will uh, take care of your okay family. that's what i figured i just want to be clear so the entire shift is downloaded not well, let me back up. I guess the better question is, is the policy that <coughs> the officer, it's officer discretion, they'll activate the camera and it will be for every stop, or every engagement with pers other persons, or how is that going to work? Every call of the camera has to be activated. If they end up having a conversation with the public, then they're supposed to activate their camera. Okay. 
Paul's action dictates what we cannot do. And that is, that'd be the easier answer. Everything that we recorded other than certain incidents. Such as? Uh, like if there was nudity involved in the scene, uh, if it was sexual abuse, uh, that that there's very few like things that will not be recorded. And it actually has to be dictated in your instant report of why it's not being recorded, and it has to be on audio, such as, you know, I'm, I'm definitely over and I'm going to have to stop recording because of X, Y, or Z. Right, and I'm sure with Ms. Bell on the panel, she was she had all the rules and guidelines for that those victims are interviewed in a different format and a different manner. So, okay, great. Um, and then I, I would like to hear how you think wearing these is going to impact your sense of safety. In my personal opinion, it actually makes me feel a little safer because now it's not what does the citizen say against me or what do I say against them. It's 100% if I was right or I was wrong, the citizen was right or the citizen was wrong, it is recorded. Um, so if something ever is said, I can hit the play button, all of us can sit down and watch it at the same point, and, and it's there. Okay. And this might be more for the social workers at the table. But taking that one step further, so if safety and that sense of um, comfort is, uh, and confidence is in the officer, um, what are the likelihoods of, of better community engagement? Again, as I said, people's perception is their reality. And I think having these cameras, uh, as the officer said, it gives an opportunity for a dialogue. So what the officer said and what the citizens said and how they feel about it, now we have what's recorded and we can see what actually happened. I think for many African Americans, uh, there is a sense of distrust. And I think this is a step I'm not going to say this is the end or cure to, to issues. As I said, there are other systemic issues that we need to address. But I think that this is a step in the right direction towards transparency so that people can feel a level of trust. Because we need our officers. They protect us. But we, citizens also need to feel safe and secure as a citizen of the United States. So, you know, I guess the social worker in me, working with juveniles now, well, for a long time I'm old, um, is that um, of course, my kids still have jello for brains. They're not fully formed adults, and you know this better than most. So, you know, I guess my hope is that gives you the opportunity now that you feel more confident and that, you know, think that you can have those moments of engagement and, you know, entertaining that there's, there's conversation to be had as far as, you know, whether before or after you've dealt with whatever the matter is. So. That's, I guess, my hope. One, one of the biggest things that, that truly makes me feel good about wearing a camera is no matter what the incident is, the good income, outcome or not, it's on camera. And you know, someone that's never been in law enforcement can sit down and watch the video and see, hey, this is exactly what happened, transparency. Okay. Judge Roberts, can I add something, please? Yes, it would be me. Thank you. Um, where, where are you? <laughs> um, I, I also want to add to that that Dr. Wright and I have um, had some conversations outside of our stakeholder meetings because of our mutual interest in making sure that um, all aspects of our community um, and all aspects, especially with youth, um, are that their needs are represented in such a way. And we also acknowledge and have taken a personal commitment with each other that this is the beginning of a dialogue in our community. It is certainly not, it is a piece of technology or a tool, but it's the beginning of a bigger di a t um, dialogue that we have committed to each other around making sure that our youth, regardless of their ethnicity, are aware of how and that the use of the camera could potentially impact, you know, just their well-being. I mean, as you've stated, you know, their, jello, their brains are still jello. Um, and just to be able to know how to engage, how to engage in a, in a conversation about how to conduct yourselves on both ends, how you do learning and education, and how you do some, you know, some um, outreach um, from the sheriff's perspective. And so we believe that our role hasn't ended just because the grant has been um, approved, and that we will be making some, you know, some further extension of that work within the confines of the stakeholder community and outside to be able to start engaging populations of people in the bigger dialogue. Um, and what our mutual commitments are to each other about making those a thriving, nurturing community. All right, two more questions, I promise. For our taser representative, you, 
you, and it may have just been how you said it, but you said that there'll be a prosecutor's version. What does that mean? Basically, what the teaser's trying to do is set up a, uh, an account for the DA's office as well. The reason why we do that is for any other agencies in the surrounding area, they would be able to partner up with the DA's office and share their evidence with them as well. But it's not a version, it's not an edit, it is a access. Is that what you're saying? It's okay, it's access. I was not just version, if I read um, So I can't help you, the judge. Um, and I guess the other question is, as we spell soon, quick, it will be our uh, probate judge over magistrate as well. Are these going to use a bond appearance, or is this going to be further down the line that any video would be used? Uh, not yet at bond proceedings, but they certainly will be available for the traffic court and other hearings, preliminary hearings and those sorts of things. Okay. I'm done. Thank you all. So my questions are, um, how do you protect against hacking in the cloud? And uh, from the perspective of the the version, uh, how do you protect against uh, the, the video being manipulated? And then, the, and I guess I'll let you ask the, answer those two questions and then I'll ask the other question. So your first question around hacking in the cloud, um, this is actually, the data is being stored in Microsoft Azure, which is uh, the same platform that the DOJ, the FBI, many state and local governments are using to house all of their data. Um, we spend here at Taser roughly about a million dollars in security trying to even hack our own system. So it's just a constant, constant uh, security that we're doing on our end. And then Microsoft Azure, we actually have security credentials, white papers, sieges compliant. Um, it's actually some of the best security that's out there. And then, so in terms of it being edited, who has access to it? For your second part of your question, for editing, the only people that will have access to the video uh, to be able to do edits will be admins within the system, and in the service <coughs> office will be dictating who has what access points in evidence.com. But no matter what, the original video always stays. So what that means is no matter what edits you make into that video, you will always be able to see that original video. It's like layers. So you'll always have the original. Any edits that are made, you'll be able to see who it was made by, the IP address, the date, the time, but you can always go back and reference that original. So it's, it is stored in the cloud. It is not stored on a local server, and It's stored in the yes, cloud. Yes, ma'am. It's stored absolutely in evidence.com, which is cloud-based. Thank you. And there's also an audit trail from the moment that video is uploaded in evidence.com. So the moment, that uh, deputy or officer takes that uh, body worn camera and dots it, and it gets uploaded to evidence.com. It has badge number, date, time, IP address, and the deputy's name. And then any time it's ever accessed, you download it, anything happens at all, you can see the IP address, the person, date, and time. So you can print this audit trail out and see everyone that's viewed it and had their hands on it. So the original always is. Good to know. <laughs> Mr. Schultz, before you move on, just to alleviate any concerns about this concept of editing, we do need to be able to edit, I know at least for the courtroom, because for example, someone in speaking in interaction with law enforcement may say something about their past criminal history. Well, we can't, we don't want the jury to know about that because that might prejudice the jury against them and have a jury worry about what they did in the past versus the incident that's going on on trial before them. So we do need the ability, at least for prosecution, to edit to protect the rights of a criminal defendant. So we need software that can be edited. We have had problems in the past with software that can't and trying to make those edits to protect the rights of the defendants. But we did make sure with Taser there would always be an original so that when edits are made for prosecution purposes in court and protecting the defendant's rights, we still know exactly what happened through the original. And there is a trail. There is yes. an IP trail that designates who may have had that edit opportunity. Correct. So I'm uh, good. Um, the last question that I have is, um, when the officers are wearing the body cameras in the field, what's the storage capacity on those cameras? For example, if the if the, if they're if it's a it's a long process and they have to wear them a long period 
time? Is there any dependence that is necessary on cellular or wireless in the field? Because as you know, we have a lot of areas that are not served by cellular and wireless. We absolutely understand that. And, and no, they do not have to rely on any wireless or 4G or 3G LTE. There is eight gigs of storage in the camera. That just to kind of put that in perspective, probably roughly two to three days worth of footage would be stored on there. So even if a deputy officer forgot to dock it one day, it's never going to overwrite that footage that's in there. Thank you very much. What happens if you forget to activate your camera? There's policy set forth that uh, you can actually be disciplined. <coughs> have disciplinary action taken against you if you do not. Okay, so it's going to be a learning process to learn to hit that button every time. Uh, for Taser, why would not just just stay on for the 12-hour shift? Just because they don't want to record everything? Or? Yeah, privacy of the officer if they're using the customer. <coughs> yeah, we don't want that. <coughs> that, the, the whole system, the files, how much storage would be within the 12-hour period right. would be outrageous, and that means it would cost Taser a lot more money to be able to maintain that period than I can say it to. So that means it would be more cost than our other. Okay. Um, does Taser maintain like a ghost image of the main file in case your server crashes? Well, we, we have redundancy. So that means we have multiple locations. Okay. Um, what's your rate of failure of the cameras? It depends on which one we're talking about. If we're looking at the point of view. Are you asking about how often they break? Is that your question? Well, I mean, obviously you've tested these things to make sure that these are the best ones for the officers to keep everybody safe, citizens and officers. Sure. I mean, how reliable are they? What's your... They're, they're very durable. They've been tested. Even in the state of Georgia, unfortunately, there's an officer that was dragged. I think it was over 60 feet in the vehicle and he was caught. The suspect took off. The camera still stayed on. It's been tested underwater. Uh, unfortunately, the suspect got tased. The officer had to turn in the rescue mode, dive in after him, and the camera still worked. So, I mean, these things have been tried and sure it's about some of the most rugged conditions out there down in Louisiana, all the way up to upstate New York in the cold um, there, very good. And I'd like to add to that. Um, we have the same original cameras that we get the Taser sent us. Those were not even brand new when we got them. And we haven't had a single issue out of them since. Um, all the other cameras that we tried to try it out, we had issues with them. From the start, um, Taser has left those with us for the entire, we've had them, what, six, eight months total. So, and we've had no issues whatsoever. That's the only two that have sent us no replacement parts or anything. If anything ever happens, we replace, we'll actually overnight them to them, and we have spares built into the actual contract so that they're never going to And the last question um, looking at the videos, with the point of view camera and then the body camera, as you said, um, you don't catch their hands, you know. So why would you even have the body camera? Why not just require a point of view for everyone? The, uh, the reason that we went with the body cams over the POVs for the main reasons is CID, they don't wear them at all times. Um, most of the time they're spent in the office, so all they gotta do is just pick up and go and not have to worry about trying to get the headset correct and everything. Um, not every officer in CID is going to be assigned and they're just going to be assigned to whenever they go out to a field interview. Um, SROs, you know, they're they are out moving around the schools and stuff. Um, it's just more practical for them to wear them on the chest um, because it, and also at the school level, then they have all the cameras around the building already and everything else. So most of the stuff is caught, but we just want to be able to have the camera on them in case they need it. So that we don't have to worry about the wires and everything else like that as far as um, having to get it set up every time they want to use it. It can just sit on the chest. Um, and then the SRT team, for what they do, our SRT team is our special response team, which is inside the jail that helps whenever there's an issue inside one of the cells, um, cell blocks. Um, it's more practical for them to be able to have it on their chest without the wires so that way when they go in and have to um, remove an inmate from the cell block, move to a segregation pod, the wires aren't in the way. Um, because I mean, they're constantly moving with shields and everything else like that. 
we just feel that it's more practical for the officers on the patrol to have the POV because they're constantly looking at cars, constantly having to clear houses and everything else. So that way you get their view because you're more likely to run into an incident involving something that you need to see with the officers. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gwen Catlich, president of Newton County NAACP, and I want to thank you all for doing the background to see the use and the purposeness of using the body-worn cameras and how it can help us, and to commend Sherp Brown and his staff as well. Um, letting you know that, as Dr. Wright said, this is one of the things that the NAACP from our national um, agenda feel that it will be a good thing to have in place not only for law enforcement but also for the citizens and that will help build that relationship a lot better than it is right now. Before we close I would just like to make a couple of comments uh, concerning some of the concerns that others may have raised earlier. Um, one thing about the new county sheriff's office and some may look at us or look at this community as been a small community, but we at the Newton County Sheriff's Office, we think big. We think big all of the time. And one of the reasons why, we want to give you examples of why we think big. If we did not think big, we would not be in the top 100 law enforcement agencies in the state of Georgia. If we did not think big, we would not be among the 1,400 in the United States of America. If we did not think big, we would not have all the certification and accreditations that we have on the walls at the Newton County Sheriff's Office and also the Board of Commissioners. We believe in giving the best to our citizens. Someone mentioned about recorded. I don't believe there is a statute in Georgia law that require us to announce that we are recorded. However, we go one step over and beyond to require that. As someone mentioned about policies, all of you know that policies are made to govern. <laughs> We know that the first week we may not get it all right. But I think we have, if you look at it systematically, we're consistent across the board in making sure that we get it right. Also, We mentioned about the policies and procedures uh, earlier. Department of Justice, I believe I stated earlier that they're using our policy as a template to pass on to other agencies. So I think that's big volume. Uh, we have our policy division, we have our legal team that work with us. The reason why I say that we do not think small, newcomers of Georgia be future in the new county sheriff's office I believe is going to be in the October magazine as a result of this this rollout of the cameras and being one of the recipients of the Department of Justice grant so there are a number of there are a number of things that I can keep mentioning about the office of sheriff of new county and the professionalism of each and every one of the officers with the new county sheriff's office as all of you know, I never take credit for, for any of uh, I take credit for all of the bad. But all of the good, I give it to my officers. Because without them, we could not be who we are today. And as I always have said, I take criticism, they take criticism, and we wear it on our shoulders, just like it picked our rank here on our shoulders. That is the way we take criticism. We ask any of you at any time, if you find criticism, please address that. Make us aware of the wrong. Make us aware of the shortfall that we are facing. I challenge all of you. Again, uh, there's no other comments. 
Again, I want to thank uh, Congressman Johnson again for being so supportive, uh, making sure that we always uh, get our fair shake um, when we come to grants uh, from the Department of Justice. And thank all of you for coming out this morning.